go. Hey YouTube, this is Asplan227. Yesterday, or a few hours ago, I had a pretty much like a three-hour conversation with Eagle Eye about the um, Occupy Wall Street protest, libertarianism, and socialism. Uh, unfortunately, a large amount of that uh, conversation didn't come through with any sound. I have the first half an hour where we took a break um, after that half an hour. Uh, the sound on this, his voice was really low, so I had to turn all of the sound up. So my sound might be pretty loud, so you might want to adjust your volume. I don't want to blow your speakers. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank Darinak for fixing the audio on this. Uh, so give me feedback on, on this conversation. What did you think of it? Uh, that's all. Are they big business? Are they big corporations? No, they're unions of the working class. Okay. I, I don't see... The unions and the union bosses can be considered fat cats because they're getting paid millions. They're able to take millions out of their own coffers and live the high life. So you know, it's, kind of, it's an interesting thing to see how people look at the Koch brothers and they look at you know big fat cat CEOs and Wall Street people living the high life and they say, you don't deserve that. But they look, then they gladly give their union dues to the unions and then they, they listen to their marching orders from their union bosses who are living the exact same lifestyle and making a lot, you know, a lot of the money and they don't earn it. Those people are not earning it because the money is being taken by force because in a lot, of, not, not always by force, but like in a, in a non-right to work state, um, you have to join the union in order to be a part of it by like certain professions. Like, you know, in Illinois, you have to be in the teachers' union to teach in the public schools. Yeah. Regardless of your politics. And they take your money out of your paycheck, regardless of whether or not you want to even be in the union. And they give it to the union bosses, and the unions give 99% to the Democrats. So if you're a Republican, you're actually funding the Democrats if you're a teacher in Illinois. Okay. You... <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know what to say to, about the teacher thing. Um, the purpose of the union is so... It doesn't matter. It, it does matter. The purpose of the union doesn't matter. They are power brokers for policy. It doesn't matter if they're... You know, the ends don't justify the means. Okay. As for the business thing, it, what, what you said... You're saying that this thing here is an accurate measure of all the money that's going everywhere. No, I didn't say that. So why, why did you send... You gotta realize that th this isn't inaccurate. The, the, this isn't the problems that people are talking about. If, if this page right here accurately resembled the way things are, there wouldn't be much of a problem. It doesn't. It doesn't. I'm sorry, it doesn't. It, I, I don't even... I don't see... Well, f for instance, th this is kind of a different subject, but this is something I wanted to ask you about before. You say you don't understand or that the socialist position... Uh, or basically this. You said that the police are not socialists because, by definition, that is outside the bounds of socialism. I'll give you that. I don't have a problem with that. It's a proper role of government to protect its citizens. Okay. That is simply an opinion. Oh, no, it's not. Not at all. There's a... Do you know the definition of socialism? I, I don't really care about the definition of socialism. You don't care Actually, I didn't say anything. You you did what you accused me a second ago. You interrupted me before I finished. What I'm saying is, you say we should... A guy is holding a gun to someone's head. 
we pay for the beliefs to stop that, to stop him from pulling the trigger. I think we sh- if the guy does pull the trigger, we should also pay for the hospital bill if that guy doesn't have any money. I think it shouldn't stop at the police. You don't. Neither of those is tyranny. We just disagree about how far it should go. Well, now you're getting into a whole different argument about socialist healthcare. Wouldn't that be part of socialism? Uh, that the, it, well, isn't that. Yeah, we can discuss all day long about whether socialism is good or bad. You're denying that they actually are socialists in the first place. When did I deny that there are socialists in the well, first place? you're angry at me for saying that, you know, for calling them out. I'm saying, I, I said that, hey, there are a bunch of people that want a bunch of stuff for free. They want, you know... Well, it's not for free. We're paying taxes. <laughs> like, I, I could see if they were just like... Well, as a whole, yes, are paying taxes. But when it comes right down to it, they are not paying taxes. 50% of the country is paying taxes that is paying for the other 50% to get their benefits. That, that, when you're talking about we, you gotta be really careful about... Okay, that. that's not true. Are you talking about businesses paying their taxes? Uh-huh. Okay. You realize that businesses only pay more in taxes in one type of tax. Mo- we, we get our money from salaries and normal paychecks. They don't get their money from normal, from salary. They get their money from investments that aren't, the tax is not high on that. So we're paying a higher percentage than they are. I have to start asking you to actually provide evidence for the claims you're making because you're making some rather broad claims without actually backing that. All right, let's do that. Give so me one sec. I got that for you. Evidence from me. You're requiring me to back up my claims, but you're not doing it for yourself. I, I only actually required one thing. I required that thing you gave me a second ago I asked for a source I actually I don't ask that you give me the benefit of the doubt but I am trying to give you the benefit I'm just showing you that there's a difference between you know they're all just evil or not evil they're all just lazy and I disagree with their position there's, there's actually data that refutes what you just said about the tax rates and they're not paying as much yeah, and there's data that refutes your refutation. I mean, okay. <laughs> you, <laughs> so, so when, when am I going to be allowed to use data and when am I not going to be allowed to use data? It's not that you're not allowed to use data. You need to you're look at where the data is coming from. Am I only allowed to use data that agrees with you? I mean, I can refute your data with other data. You don't see the problem here? Well, I can, I'm providing data from the Cato Institute. Okay, I believe you. I mean, if it's from, you know, you have to look at the source of that. If it's from, oh, I don't know, thinkprogress.org or, you know, uh, what's that other, Media Matters, you know, who are avowed liberal, uh, liberal uh, socialists that, you know, they're, they're not nonpartisan. You know, you have to, there's, heck, there's, yeah, in two, at least two of my college courses, we had entire sections on determining what the, whether a source is a good source. Or you don't have to tell me that. I know that. That's... So, well, I, I, I hope you would know that. that yeah. There's, you know, you have to examine the source. Like, you know, someone providing a wiki page is not a good source compared to someone providing, like, you know, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics from the government showing unemployment. You know, the wiki page, Bureau of Labor and Statistics, hmm, which do I trust more? You know. Um, I guess the one not being paid. <laughs> you, you, you gotta realize that, yeah, there are nonpartisan things. I'll give you the nonpartisan things, but a lot of the things... Uh, hold up. I'm trying to find the source, and I'm having trouble multitasking. Um, while I'm looking for this, could you actually show me the thing that refutes the tax thing? Because I just linked it. 
Oh, okay, good. I mean, look at that right quick. Because the name of that might actually help me find what I'm looking for. Because... There's a lot of misdirection going on with the stuff about, like, you know, the, the taxing of the rich as well. Like when Warren Buffett demanded, he said, you know, why don't you pay, you know, charge, I, I, I should be paying more in taxes. And there's a couple of problems with that. One, there's nothing stopping him from paying more taxes. He can actually write a check to the government. So two, he's $600 billion in the hole in his tax bill, which is kind of funny. Um, or, some, I, or maybe it's $6 billion. I can't He's, like, he's just, he's behind on his taxes. He hasn't paid, he's like in arrears on his tax bill. Uh, and three, the taxes, if, if taxes were raised today, the money that he's already made has already been taxed. So he's already made his millions. Why should he care? If he, if he, even if he was taxed at 100%, why would he care? The money he already has has already been taxed. And can't be taxed again. 2007. Um, yeah, I'm reading this, and it seems more like it's talking specifically about his company. Well, he's, it's using his company as, a, as an example, but the, the charts are from, you know, the overall economy. Chart 2, CBO data for 2007. Yes, that's the uh, Congressional Budget Office. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, included or it's all federal income taxes, corporate income, payroll, and excise taxes. Uh, again, I'm not sure... Could you explain to me how this is refuting the claim that companies... There is... They pay a higher tax on, what is it called? The capital gains tax? Is that the word I'm looking for? Yeah. There are other... It's actually double taxation. Yeah, I know. There are other taxes they pay less on, or not less on, they pay the same amount. But since they don't have to, it doesn't fall into the same category. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? I... Well, look at chart number two that we were talking about. That chart is about individual income taxes, corporate income taxes, payroll taxes, and excise taxes. I don't think it includes capital gains. But then, uh, yeah, below that, in 2007, Buffett said that he paid a 17.7% tax rate. Now, in Rellin's note, that Buffett earns large amounts of capital gains, gains which are taxed at a maximum federal rate of 15%. People in the top income groups do report a lot of capital gains, which reduces their overall effective tax rate. However, capital gains, gains are included in chart one above, and you can see that the top income groups still pay a much higher tax rate than others on average. Okay, so capital gains taxes are included in that first chart, where it's like if you're making $10 million or more, you're still paying 22.6%. Now, I'd like you to, I challenge you um, to think, okay, how, many, how much money would the average person on the street that's in those protests right now, how much are they, what would they be making if they actually had a job? Probably around 50 to 100,000, maybe 150 at most. Uh, I, Let's uh, even say 200,000 at most. Wait, I have another problem with what you just said. It, it, not all of them are unemployed. I mean, many of them are. Uh, uh, if they were all unemployed. Okay, An another thing you have to realize is that the poorer you are, the harder taxes hit you. 10% of a billion dollars, you're still rich as a motherfucker. So, th that's... Should we take all of it except for the, what they need to live on? Where's the, no one's claiming that. Well, where's the line? The you tell me where the line is, then we can actually evaluate if that's, a, if that's appropriate. The line... I'm never being drawn. They want to return the line to at least where it was in the Clinton era. You know what the difference between that line and this line is? It's about 3%. <laughs> yes. That should tell... Do you know what the Fortune, four, uh, Fortune 500 is? Mm-hmm. 
We have like six of them in six Fortune 500 companies in Omaha. Okay. I, I don't know if you know the difference in money. It, it seems like that's a small amount. The amount of money that's at the top, we, it, it's not like we're in the 1960s where the money is spread out evenly across the classes. When you have a top percent that has a vast amount, a much, much higher percentage, that 3% would be the equivalent of 30% taxing the lower class. You're, you're saying that that's a 3% difference. Yeah, that's 3%. Three... <laughs> yeah, it's a. Th I don't know what you're arguing. Okay, let's say. Let's say the poor had one-tenth the amount that the rich had. You increase... No, no, no. Just... Let's work with this. You, um... Let's say you had that. And you say that you raise the taxes of the rich um, 3%. Now, that's not going to be much because the disparity is not that much. You're raising taxes on an amount that's already not much higher than the rest. But when, let's say, that the poor class, the lower class, has one-tenth of one percent, if you go to the top and increase the taxes by 3%, you're no longer talking about a little increase. You're talking about billions and billions of dollars, maybe over a, over, um, a decade or two into the trillions. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're using... I'm not really following you. I apologize. I'm just... All right. Okay. You're saying... I don't the numbers, and I don't think you have, and I think that maybe extrapolating numbers that don't aren't really true. I don't know. Okay, how much do you think the upper 5% have compared to the low, the... I don't think about it because the comparison is irrelevant. No. Okay. No, it's not. Oh, yes. 3% on 90% of the money is more than 3% on, say, 50% of the money. Okay, that's not what you asked. Uh, that's what I was trying to say. What I'm trying to say is, um, you say that that's only that's you know that's only a three percent difference. Yeah, it's three percent on an insane amount of money. That's a huge difference. Right. It, it's not a small difference. That's what. That's all we want. We want to return the economy to the way it was in the Clinton era. We want the law, the regulations that were around in the Clinton era. We want the taxes to be similar to what they were in the Clinton era. They're not asking for, we want the business to be taxed 50% uh, more than they are, because that's physically impossible. Like, that couldn't happen. They know that. They're, you might say they're stupid, but they're not, like, retarded. They, they know they can't. It's like, we, we want to eat their flesh and wear their suits. Like, they're, they want the taxes returned to the Clinton era taxes. No, how much was that? No, I don't know the exact amount. What was it? Okay, so you don't know these things, and yet you're making demands that it should be what ought to be. You're, you're, you're basically making a prescriptive demand that it ought to be this because you think it's going to be better for the economy and actually get people back, you know, uh, pro provided for, back to work, whatever, right? Yes. Okay, that is demonstrably not true, and I can actually sh point, show you the actual... Uh, Congressional Budget Office and um, what's the other uh, OMB Office of Management and Budget. Those two offices combined, they, I've, come, I've looked at both the data. They all jive. I don't know if you've seen. I, I made a video about it where I'm you know, looking at um, all of the data. I have a spreadsheet and I'm like showing the actual spreadsheet in the video where I'm looking at the historical tax rates. Now, just. Bear with me for a minute. Did you know that the top end tax rate for the richest of the rich used to be 91%? Yeah. 
Mm, yeah, I did know that. Uh, that started in 1950. It went up to 92% in 52 and 53. Back down to 91% all the way through 1963. And then um, dropped to 77% the next year and 70% after that in 65. Uh, went back up for just a tad, a little bit in 68, so 75.25%, 69 to 77% again. So it kind of fluctuated during the 60s, and in the 70s it flattened out at 70%. Oh. 71 all the way through 1980. So for a decade, we had 70%. Now, so the 70s were actually a recession decade. Uh-huh. Carter and, and uh, Nixon and Ford, right? Yes. So we had 70% uh, ta- highest tax rate, and here's the key to it. What, what a lot of people don't understand about, like, when it comes to the federal budget and deficits and and unemployment and such, is that it's not about how much dollars you bring in. It's about, it, it, and it's not even about the tax rate. I actually proved this with the, you know, with the data that I have. The actual person, you will always get a certain percentage of your gross domestic product in federal tax revenues regardless of the tax rate. It's amazing. It's crazy. I mean, it's just one of those mind-blowing things. Hey, 91% top tax rate on the richest of the rich, 18%. 70%? 70% top tax rate on the richest of the rich, hey, 18%. 26% tax rate on the richest of the rich. Wow, we're still only getting 18% of our GDP. And that's because of there's a, there's a it has to do with the whole trickle down theory, and, uh, but not oh, trickled. Don't go there. Trickle down does work. <laughs> think people are, don't understand what trickle down actually is, and actually trickle down is the worst name for it ever because it's not like a fountain where things are like flowing from the top tier to the next tier to the next tier. It's not like that. It's a circular thing. The economy is circular. The economy has like circulation of money, and it's all about the gross domestic product, the actual productive capacity of the nation, the amount of products that are created, not the amount that's consumed. Right. So anyway, gross domestic product is the actual indicator of how much money the federal government will get, regardless of the tax rate. Uh, and I have this chart that proves it. I see that on this chart that I have, I have this purple line that shows a fluctuation of the of the uh, percent or the amount of revenue as a percentage of GDP, and it's this flat line all the way across the bottom. It has a couple little spikes in it, but you know, basically the minimum and maximum is like 16.7 percent to 20 percent, and the average, the mean across the entire thing is 18 percent. So it's like it, it, it like it's almost like freaking water in you know it will always seek a, a nice level amount. It's like, oh, well, we can make a wave here, but it'll just level out back to 18%. And this is a well-known thing among economists. People are like, yeah, 18% of GDP is what you can expect. This is why, like, actually lawmakers know too, like, if you look at the Paul Ryan plan, and I think uh, Rand Paul has suggested this as well, the constitutional amendment pegging government spending at 18% of GDP. So, like, every year they have to find out what the GDP was, and they can only spend 18% of it at, at, in a balanced budget, right? Okay. That's because they know they're only going to get about 18% of GDP in terms of tax revenue. All right. So this is well known. But here's the funny thing. Um, throughout the 70s, we had 70% uh, tax, uh, you know, highest tax rate. Then we went to 16, or 69.13%. It's the weirdest tax rate in the entire history uh, since 1940. Um, but then in 82, it went down to 50%. This, this was the first Reagan era tax cut. And if you actually look at the percent growth, the, the percent growth of GDP per capita, because you know, the more people you have, the more GDP you're going to have, right? Uh-huh. And we're, you know, we're looking across a whole like six decades or five decades here. There's going to be a huge growth. In fact, the, the population of the United States has doubled in the past five years. So you have to look at not just GDP itself, because, because if you double the population, you're probably going to double your GDP. So if you look at the gross domestic product per person in the country, that flattens it out. That, that, that equalizes it out in some level playing field, as far as like analysis of the data, right? And then you 
look at the percent change of GDP growth per person, that's the metric you look for to see if whether or not a policy or a tax rate is actually helping, right? Are you following me so far? Yeah, no, I understand. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, the... So, here's the thing. In the 70s, I mean, this is actually you know, kind of benign. It doesn't really prove my point all that well, but it's, it's, il it's illustrative of the point. 70% tax rate, we had a negative 1.74% growth, and then a 0.65% growth, then 5% growth in 1973, very small growth in 74, negative growth, positive growth in 75 and 76, 3.75%, 3, 4.4, or 2.59, negative 2.72 in 1980, that was the recession that, that Reagan inherited in 1980 from the previous administration. You know, when people were like you know, waiting in line to get gas and stuff. So Reagan started lowering taxes, right? And we had, it's like, oh, negative 2.72, then a 3.3% growth, then a negative 2.8% growth per person, right? Then it starts going up. In the 83, it was 0.65, then it went up to 5.75% growth, 3.1, 2.3. 1.5, 3.5, 3%. It was like consecutive growth. In, some, you know, in the 70s, it was kind of fluctuating back and forth and never more than like 2%. Well, there was a 4% in one year, right? And there was another 4%. But now we have 5% or anything. It's, it, it's just, I, when I, I was doing this data, I didn't know what I was looking for. And I was like saying, you know, make, doing the logic and everything. Saying, you know, what an impact does it actually have? It was, it was actually very cool to see. Um... We see GDP growth as a percentage from year to year overall. That's illustrative as well. Uh, in the 70s, we had at most like 5.57. In 84, after the uh, uh, tax cuts had a chance to kind of go into effect, 6.6, 4.1, 3.3. Nice consecutive growth years after the taxes were, were reduced from 70 to 50%. Then they get reduced again from 50% to 38.5, then to 28 for two years. And in 89, when Bush Sr. was in office, uh, that was the last year, 28%. Then it went back up to 31%. This is all growth years. Okay. But then the taxes, after it went up to 31%, we saw a 1.27% decline in GDP. All right. That's interesting. So raising taxes reduced GDP, which actually reduced revenues. Okay. As, because the percentage of GDP is always, it's always going to be eighty percent. So then it went up to thirty nine point six percent, and we saw anemic growth one point three percent, two point nine. Now here's the here's the cool thing about the nineties. This is what you know. You may think that I'm just like this anti Democrat type person. I actually liked Bill Clinton. Okay. Okay. Bill Clinton was a good president, mainly because he understood how business works. And he was, you know, he was pretty pro-business, but he was also very much like, hey, you know what? We're out of the Cold War now. Maybe we can cut defense spending. Yeah. He, he closed down a record number of military bases because he's like, Cold War's over. Soviet Union's gone. We don't. And because of that, he actually ushered in a nice big boom. Oh, definitely. And I'm, I'm happy for that. You know, I'm glad for that because. And I think we should do the same thing. I am against these foreign wars, too. And I'm against all this spending on the militarism, too. I'm a Ron Paul supporter. I'm all, I'm all for getting out of Afghanistan and Iraq. And the only place I think our military should be is South Korea. Because the Korean War is still on, and we are bound by treaty to protect them. You know? Yeah, it's technically. Our obligation by treaty. Uh, international <laughs> Yeah. So we kind of have to. Yeah, no, I understand that. We don't want to just abandon, because <laughs> normally there's like a gray area, but pretty sure North Korea is evil. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there, could, there's a gray area most of the time, but they're actually putting their people in camps. <laughs> so... <laughs> Oh, yeah, no. Believe me, I've seen, like, three documentaries on North Korea. Yeah, that makes me an expert, but you, you get what I'm saying. Oh, certainly. Certainly. <laughs>